The reading this morning is from Mark, chapter 2, verses 23 through 3 and 6. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind, and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. The Word of God. You can find so many wonderful things on the internet, can't you? It's really pretty awesome when you just get out there and play around. There is a story that is supposedly about Margaret Mead, and I hope it's true because it's all over. If you Google her name, you will find this story. The trouble is it doesn't say where it happened or when it happened or, you know, a source for it. So I'm not sure that it's true, but the story has some power to it. So I'm going to share it with you anyway, and just keep in mind it might not really be Margaret Mead. But here's the story. One day a student asked anthropologist Margaret Mead for the earliest signs of civilization in any given human culture. He expected the answer to be a clay pot, or a fish hook, or a grinding stone. Her answer surprised him. I'm going to, you're going to take that one off? Okay. <laughs> Her answer surprised him. She said she believed the earliest sign of civilization was a healed femur. The femur is the thigh bone. In a society that's based on hunting and gathering, a person with a fractured thigh bone would be unable to care for themselves and useless. Mead explained that no healed femurs are found where the law of the jungle, the survival of the fittest, reigns. Someone with a broken femur would simply be allowed to die. But a healed femur showed that someone cared. Someone had to hunt and gather food for that injured person until their leg healed. Someone had to provide care for the person who couldn't care for themselves. She said the evidence of compassion was the first sign of true civilization. Compassion is a funny word. The Greek word for it literally means to be moved as to one's bowels, which sounds messy and kind of gross. <laughs> but in, in ancient Greek times, the bowels were thought to be the seat of love and pity. That's where they lived. And compassion is sort of this curious mix of both of those things. So when they said somebody was moved with compassion, they meant they physically felt something. It was a visceral response that seemed to come from that area of the body. In Latin, it's a little bit more palatable to us. It means to suffer with someone. Their pain causes us to feel pain too. And that's how it's supposed to work. Dr. Brene Brown is a research professor at the University of Houston in the Graduate School of Social Work. Her areas of interest include courage, vulnerability, shame, and empathy. And she's written four books that ended up on the New York Times best-selling list about those topics. 
She also has the distinction of holding one of the top five most viewed TED Talks in the world. How many of you do TED Talks? They're fascinating if you haven't ever watched them. She is one of the top five in the world. Over 30 million people have viewed it. It was called The Power of Vulnerability. So in her book, Braving the Wilderness, she makes an interesting statement. She says that people that show high levels of compassion tend to have clear boundaries which are well respected. She said it's hard to stay kind hearted when you feel people are taking advantage of you or threatening you. But that is exactly what Jesus was able to do. And he indeed had very clear boundaries that he respected and lots and lots of compassion. He was acknowledged as a religious leader, but he seemed sometimes to intentionally provoke controversy. In this case, by looking as if he was flaunting some of the religious laws. And there were indeed people threatening him, but he still managed to be kind and compassionate. So on Sabbath, that's the day when no work is to be done, it's a day dedicated to God. We start off in our, our reading for today, they are going through grain fields, he and his disciples, and the disciples are picking the grain. They're going to eat it. Now, that's work. To be clear, the Jewish law never said if somebody's starving to death, you shouldn't feed them. But these guys were not likely starving. They probably ate the day before. They probably could have picked some of this grain the day before. They could have waited until sundown to eat. So the religious leaders, these good people, you understand, challenged him on this. Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus seems at first like he deflects it kind of the way a child would almost. He says, don't you remember your hero David? And he went into the sanctuary and he ate some of the food that he wasn't supposed to eat and he gave it to his companions. But then he goes on to say, the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Well, that's fighting words <laughs> because he's claiming in essence to be God. He's saying that he is in charge of the Sabbath, which God has given rules about. And here Jesus is saying, don't take it so rigidly. It's meant to help you, not to harm you. Don't become slaves to it. Then, to make matters worse, he goes right into the synagogue, their house of worship, where he encounters this man with a withered hand. This is not something that just happened. It's likely been withered for a long time. It could wait until the Sabbath was over. So these good religious folks, and I say that because sometimes we start to think the Pharisees are evil. These are the people that care about the faith. They care about what happens in the temple. They are trying to do the right thing, but they're watching him because they already know his people have been eating and picking grain on the Sabbath and that's not okay. And they know he's compassionate. So he counters this man who has this problem. Jesus knows what it's like to suffer with people, to feel compassion, and he wants to do something about it right now. They were right to watch him because he tells the man, come on up here. And then he says to the people that are watching them, he knows they're watching, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? to save a life or to kill. And nobody said anything. You know that kind of awkward silence when you know there's a trap sort of, no matter what you say, it's gonna get you in trouble somehow. There's this awkward silence because they know, yeah, he's kind of right. It's important to help this guy, but you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. They did have this law, if your animal falls into a ditch on the Sabbath, you could do the work needed to pull it out, because that makes sense, right? If it fell in, get it out. But having compassion for a fellow human being, ending their suffering if you could, Jesus says that's just as important. Why should this man have to wait another day? But still, he wasn't dying. 
he'd waited a long time, and it was the Sabbath after all. So these people are watching him. Jesus got angry. It said he was grieved at the hardness of their heart. It was though this man and his broken body weren't even as important as your animal falling into a ditch. People were used to seeing him that way. They probably even hardly saw him at all. So what's the rush? Getting back to Brene Brown's book for a moment, she talks about how we live in a time where it seems almost socially acceptable to put other people down. She calls it dehumanizing other people, starting with our words and leading into all kinds of harm that comes out of that. She quotes David Smith, who wrote a book called Less Than Human. In it, he says that we are hardwired as humans to want to avoid hurting other people. There's this sort of instinctual thing that we know we all share the same feelings and we really don't like to hurt each other. But if you can make someone seem less than human, you can override that innate thing that says don't hurt each other. If you could look at a group of other people and think they're morally inferior or even dangerous, the conflict starts being framed as good versus evil. A woman named Michelle Mays says that when you view other people this way, it helps us to become rigid in our position. If those people over there are not really human like we are, we don't have to deal with them. Look at the Holocaust. Jews were called subhuman, rats, disease carriers. Brown points out that in the genocide in Rwanda, the Hutus called the Tutsis cockroaches. Native Americans were called savages. Slaves were considered to be less than human. Brown points out that there were people that really didn't think these things through that got swept along in it. And she says the scary thing is, we are all vulnerable to the slow and insidious practice of dehumanizing. Therefore, we are all responsible for recognizing it and stopping it. She points out that on Facebook and Twitter, it's really easy to call other people names. We've talked about this before. I unfortunately see clergy groups where people are just letting each other have it because they're not right there. It's almost like play, right? They aren't really there. You can just express yourself and say whatever you want. So we stake out camps where we're over here and other people are over there. She calls us to engage in what she calls rehumanizing, where we recognize that no matter which side of an issue people are on, to dehumanize them by calling them names is a bad thing to do. She says we must never tolerate dehumanization. It's the primary instrument of violence that has been used in every genocide recorded throughout history. And if our faith asks us to find the face of God in everyone we meet, that should include politicians, the media, strangers, Twitter people, Facebook preter, all the people we most violently disagree with. She says when we desecrate their divinity, we desecrate our own, and we betray our humanity. So what happened to this man with the withered hand? Jesus was mad at the people who treated him as if he didn't matter. This man didn't matter. The people who could not feel enough compassion for him to want his suffering to be ended that very day. So Jesus tells him to stretch out his hand, and it's interesting, his hand was restored it doesn't say Jesus touched him. It doesn't say Jesus said anything. He just told him to stretch out his hand, and it was healed. And that was enough for the religious leaders to make a very strange political alliance with some followers of King Herod and conspire to destroy Jesus. He's on the other side now, less than human. We got to get rid of him. Why did they hate him so much? Wendy Farley, who's a professor in the religious department at Emory, says, by refusing to observe conventions for honoring the Sabbath, Jesus invites us into a terrifying form of faith in which time-honored practices are relativized by healing power, compassion, and joy. 
The rather terrible implication of this story is that normal and natural religious commitments can render us indifferent to human suffering and true community. They are alien to the good news Jesus desires to share with us. This conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees contrasts religion that hardens hearts with the gospel that open hearts to the ubiquitous presence of God and gives birth to compassion and joy. She goes on to say that, of course, we do have to have some standards. We can't just let everything go. And we get nervous, all of us do, when long-standing traditions seem like they're getting pushed aside. But she says, the story reminds us of the terrible price that is extracted when these commitments become idolatry. When we cherish the gifts of God, including scripture, religious conventions, and morality, and lose the power to cherish the people of God. Jesus is described as angry and grieved by his opponent's hardness of heart. But perhaps, she says, we should have some pity for the Pharisees because, she says, they are so much like us. We are indeed called to see Jesus in people who suffer. As we follow him, it's important that we too need to remain vulnerable to allow ourselves to be moved with compassion for our brothers and sisters. We need to stay open to that sense of suffering with one another even when we don't agree with them. It's not easy. It is so seductive to reduce other people to being less than human when they are different from us. But we cannot let ourselves become immune to that, no matter who's doing the name calling. Some of the religious leaders and some of the political leaders were so upset by the power of Jesus to change the world, even if it was for the better, that they conspired to destroy him. They didn't understand compassion, and they didn't much like it. They didn't understand the good news that God is all about love and compassion and grace and peace. They didn't understand for sure the power in vulnerability. May our hearts follow a different path in the footsteps of our Lord. Amen. Now I invite those who are helping with communion to come forward. <clears throat>